When you buy knives, you prefer a knife that is simple in design, yet effective? Do you prefer something that has more flair, takes more risks? I'm curious. Let me know in the comments section down below, and while you're there, show the like button some love. How's it going, everybody? I'm Roll Shambo, the connoisseur and collector of all things sharp and shiny. And this is the Beyond EDC River Wolf by John Demko. John Demko is the designer. This is the first design from John Demko that I've checked out so far. Now, I've had it in my possession for the last 10 days or so, which has given me enough time to carry it, to fidget with it, and to answer the tough questions. And now that I have, the only question left to answer is, is the Beyond EDC River Wolf a grail, or is it garbage? All right, it's time. Let's talk about the Beyond EDC River Wolf. Before we get into the skinny and rank this bad boy, in case you haven't seen Grail or Garbage before, here's how it works. We've got five categories. Each category is worth a max of 10 points each. At the end of ranking them, we will add up all the scores and then give it a final score on our leaderboard so that you have the context you need to determine if it deserves a spot in your EDC rotation. Those categories are materials, ergonomics, fidget factor, the lock, and of course, fit and finish. So let's talk about that, shall we? Materials. Materials is heavily weighed against how much does it cost? And in this case, these materials cost $300, if you can find one. You see, there is a whole bunch of hype generated around this knife, and I'm starting to see why. Let me talk more about it, okay? You've got slab titanium handle scale construction. You've got a semi backspacer, also titanium, titanium milled pocket clip, and an M390 blade. Those are pretty standard for premium materials at this price point, and so that's kind of what I expect. Everything, in my opinion, is right in line where it should be at this price point. Uh, that being said, I would have loved to have seen some carbon fiber inlays or micarta inlays, something like that would have really, really piqued my interest, but they didn't take those risks. And so for those reasons, I can't knock it because the materials are really good. Again, M390 is considered a super steel and titanium is, is the best metal material you can put on a production knife, unless you count zirconium, which we don't really see on production knives. Shout it out in the comment section if you know some production knives that have a zirconium because I kind of want to check them out. However, in this instance, it's going to score a very solid 8 out of 10 for materials. Now, the next category is ergonomics. Is it comfortable in the hand? Is there going to be any extra hot spots if you bear down on it? Can you switch up your grip? Can you choke up? Is it comfortable? Is it flexible? Is it not flexible? I mean, I don't think that flexibility is something that's important as far as the materials are concerned, but when I say flexibility, I mean, you know, can you really, really make it your own with the ergonomics? And, you know, the answer to that specific question is kinda? Let me talk more about that, okay? Uh, it tells you where to put your fingers. And you know, if you've seen my other videos, that I'm not a huge fan of being told what to do. Um, however, it is a natural place for your fingers to go, so it's not too bad, and it doesn't, it's not uncomfortable. You can actually tell that this knife was designed for someone with large to extra large size man hands. Uh, sorry, ladies, I don't necessarily think that you would find this comfortable because you're being told where to put your fingers, and most women's most women don't have man-sized hands. Going back to the ergonomics, in the regular grip, you have this nice swell right here at the top of the handle scale, right before the tang of the blade, and your thumb rests there naturally in a saber grip. Furthermore, if you decide to choke up, you have, and let me give a round of applause here, an adequately sized finger cutout. Thank you. That is fantastic. A lot of times I put my hands on a finger cutout and I wish that it was bigger. So did she, but in this case, I didn't. Uh, that's actually perfectly sized. And that flipper tab allows for you to actually put some pressure back there and get some extra grip right down there below the edge of the blade. That's nice. Now, I'm going to say something that's not so nice. They shouldn't have ignored the spine of the blade. And this is a highly, highly debatable point. There are several influencers out there that would say, no, you don't need jimping at all. 
what are you talking about? Leave the spine of the blade alone. Jimping is not needed. Well, if they were going to go simple, that was not the place that I would have done it. And here's why. If you are going to choke up, I'm assuming that your thumb has to naturally choke up as well because no one's going to choke up like this. That, that's just awkward, okay? And as great of a spot as this is for your thumb, it's only great for your thumb if you're holding it before that flipper tab. The moment you squeeze up on here, your thumb's on the spine of the blade. And so at a minimum, that jimping should have gone out to here. Instead, they were like, screw it, no jimping for you. Um, or it was an oversight and they decided not to correct. Or they just decided that they liked the look of it better without jimping. I don't know which one of those that is, but it's not something that I necessarily approve of and I think that it's actually a pretty big oversight, especially considering that this in appearances is going up against knives like the Chris Reeves Sabenza, who also has titanium slab style construction and also has premium blade steel. And I digress. My point is, is that that jimping at the, at the spine of the blade is something that I think is a big miss and that's because you have a perfect index finger cut out there. People are going to use that. They're going to use that. And you know, if you were going to use this for feather sticking, which let's be clear, I actually think that this would be a great camping knife. I think that you could do some hard, more hardcore tasks like feather sticking with this. I don't know about batoning, but it's got a decently thick blade spine and that encourages me to go ahead and carry this more in those situations. So yeah, I think that this could be a great user. Um, that jimping should be there. Let's just be clear about that. It does work extremely good in a reverse grip. It's almost just as good in a reverse grip as it is in a saber grip. And that's something that I think is really cool. I wouldn't be half surprised to find out that they were also considering self-defense uses, which is kind of funny to me because most people aren't going to use their knives for self-defense, but we like feeling that extra comfort that we could if we had to. If we had to and we got attacked at the mall by ninjas, yeah, I'd whip out this uh, river wolf. Pow, right in the kisser. Moving on, the score for ergonomics is going to come in at a respectable 7 out of 10. I know, I just said all these great things and only 7 out of 10? What the hell? Again, the lack of jimping is an oversight based on its use case scenario and the fact that they put that forward finger cut out there. If there was no forward finger cut out and they said, you know what, we want you to grip it like this behind the edge, no choke up, I would have said fine. It's plenty good that way, but they put that there and that's something that's an oversight when there is no jimping. I said what I said, if you disagree with me, pop down in the comment section. Now the next category is possibly and probably my favorite, and that is the fidget factor. Fidget factor is all about how much do you want to play with it. And I think that fidgeting with your knife is important because the more comfortable you are handling it and the more dexterous you are, uh, the more comfortable you're going to be using it and the more skillful you're going to be, I think. At least that's the way that it is for me. The knives that I fidget with the most are also the ones that I'm most useful with. It's not the tool, it's the wielder, and that actually helps build skills and dexterity over time, which I highly, highly agree with. So, uh, fidget factor is about a couple different factors, okay? Uh, first, we gotta talk about the detent, we gotta talk about the action. Things like acoustics and balance also play a role, believe it or not, and here's the thing about acoustics. It's not something that you notice until it's not there. And then all of a sudden we care because we want to know. That's why when everyone saw the Sparrow Strix production model, the first thing they asked was, does it make that tinging noise? Turns out people care. Uh, you know what? Give it a thumbs up if, uh, if you like yourself a little bit of ASMR. Yeah. So let's talk about this. Uh, the sounds that it makes are totally acceptable. They're not out of this world. There's no, you know sword in the stone type ASMR ting, you know, when it flies out, but it's, it's a nice satisfying clickety clack. And when I had this in my possession for the last 10 days, it's something that I really, really enjoyed carrying. And it's something that I really enjoyed fidgeting with. And on all good fidget knives, I usually find myself fidgeting with them without realizing it. And being able to actuate the lock comfortably is part of that because my thumb doesn't get tired disengaging that lock and that's a big part. As far as the D10 is concerned, it's not the most crisp 
thing in the world, but it's also not something that's going to be easy to fail. For example, that was a very, very light button button push and it still came out. You know, of course you could light switch this and yeah, you feel that blade come out because remember this knife weighs about seven ounces. If you wanted to see the overview where I actually go over the specs, I'll go ahead and put a link up in the corner. But talking about the fidget factor, it's good. Uh, it's not just about how many deployment options it has, which is good because there's only one. There can only be one deployment option. In this case, it's a flipper. I kind of wish, however, that they had installed an inset fuller, kind of like they did on the Loch Ness, kind of like they did on the Best Tech Loch Ness. See that? There's more than enough real estate to do that, but they didn't do that. They left it blank. And you can't tell me that they did that to make it simple because they put this billboarding on there. But that's, you know, a discussion for fit and finish. That being said, the fidget factor on here is really good. The sound is satisfying. The feeling of the blade flying open is good. And the actuation is good as well. This is running on bearings. And for a heavy knife, the action is better than what I thought it would be. Watch this. I mean, it's not really a drop guillotine. It is drop shuddy but it's not super forceful in its drop. It doesn't feel like an uncontrolled blade. It actually has a bit of a control behind it. It's going to fall shut, but it does so in more of a civilized manner, and I appreciate that. Overall, the fidget factor on here is very good. Good enough for me to give it an eight out of 10 for fidget factor. Moving on, we're gonna talk about the lock. Now, most knives are going to be frame locks in this price range, and this one is no exception. As far as the lock bar is concerned, it does have a lock bar interface, so it's steel against uh, steel rather than titanium against steel, which is nice because hardened steel will wear down titanium, and it also has an over travel stop. So that's good. Um, as far as the lockout is concerned, there is no blade play up and down, left or right, and there is no double clutch on the return. It's very easy to lock and unlock this, and it's something that you can feel confident in. As far as the lockup itself is concerned, that is a dang good lockup. I'm actually going to say that that's somewhere around the 30% range, which is kind of the sweet spot. Uh, but at the end of the day, it is still a frame lock. and. You know, they didn't necessarily take any risks with that. It's not the most amazing frame lock that I've ever felt, if I'm being honest, but it's definitely good enough to get the job done and good enough for me to have confidence in it if I was to take it feather sticking. And so for those reasons, it's nothing special. It is quite adequate, and I would say that it's better than average. And for those reasons, it's going to get a 7 out of 10 for the lock. Now, we're on to my second favorite category, which is fit and finish. Fit and finish is not just about how well manufactured it was. It's also about the design language. Did they take any risks? Uh, how well realized is the designer? Do you feel the designer in this design? This is my first time checking out a John Demko knife. See, I've checked out knives from Andrew Demko, like the AD 20.5 and the Cold Steel AD 15. And, you know, there's some things that I didn't like about those knives, and there's some things that I really did. And something that I appreciate about Andrew Demko is the risks that he takes. And in this one, let's talk first about the manufacturing. They got everything right. They got the materials right. Uh, the ergonomics are rather good, minus the fact that it's missing the jimping, which I still think is a massive oversight. There's no extra edges that are that are sharp that shouldn't be sharp. You know, the only one that should be sharp is the edge itself. That's the only cutting edge that I want. Uh, the pocket clip is great. I'm actually a fan of this pocket clip because when I hold it, I forget that it's there. Sometimes I forget to talk about it. And there is a lanyard hold for those of you that like lanyards. It's not for everybody, but it is for some people and it's nice to have options. Speaking of the pocket clip, it is reversible. So for you lefties, you have an option as well. The pivot is a single sided locking pivot and that's nice. Um, and the bearings work well. I'm actually rather impressed with the action on this and I think that everything really comes together nicely. And now comes the part that I didn't necessarily want to talk about at first because there are some great aspects to this knife. But at the end of the day, they didn't take any risks. They took no risks. There's very little about this knife that is innovative. This is a standard drop point blade. Okay, that's fine. There's a lot of great knives out there, right? Uh, these are featureless titanium slab style handle scales. 
And that's fine. I mean, there's lots of knives out there like that, right? And, you know, the pocket clip doesn't necessarily take any risks either, which is a, a point where a lot of designers actually do add a bit of flair. And in this case, they didn't. The only things that I felt was a risk was finding a way to construct this with one single body screw. That part is impressive, but the rest of it just tells me that they weren't taking chances. And I really appreciate it when designers do that because that's when we see the hobby move forward the most. And in this case, they didn't do that. They said, you know what, this here's a template for how to be successful making knives. And people love it. And I can see why it's great to fidget with. You could definitely use this in a harder use case scenario. And I say harder, not hard, but harder. Like, you know, you could do some feather sticking. You could take it camping. It's going to get the job done. You know, if you find yourself in a fight at the mall with the mall ninjas, then yeah, you could do that too. And you know what? I appreciate the extra swell right here behind the blade, which is a nice spot to rest your thumb in a normal grip. The lack of jimping is something that is not acceptable to me on a knife that costs 300 bucks and has a finger cut out this good. You told me to put my finger there and now you're telling me that my thumb has no place to rest on the top of the blade? Come on. They could have taken a design risk and created a swell there. You're telling me that we don't need jimping, but you want to support where your fingers rest naturally? Put a swell on the back of the blade. That's fine. Would it have looked funky? Yeah, but at least it would have been a chance that they were taking. They didn't take chances. And furthermore, part that I do not like is the fact that they have the billboarding on here. TM for Terramundi. Okay. I can live with that. Then there's more. M390 and John Demko. I'm actually okay with the John Demko design. I would have preferred it on this blank pivot. You have a perfect landing spot for it right there. Why didn't you put it there? Todd Knife and Tool does that on their best tech knives, and I highly agree with that, but they didn't do that. They just, you know what, that's fine. We'll just slap it right there, that's fine. We want our billboarding. Uh, they have a spot for a serial number here at the top where it says M390. I, I'm okay with the serial number at the top of the blade, but that M390 could have gone anywhere. You see, this knife has a ton of real estate and they could have put it somewhere so it was still there and let us enjoy the knife. I mean, you know what? You left the spine of the blade right there. Why not put why not put M390 on the spine of the blade? A spot where people don't really look all the time. I'll, I'll tell you why, because they wanted it where we could see it, so there was no doubt in your mind that this was indeed super steel. And that's kind of corny to me. Um, you know, the billboarding on here is kind of disappointing in my opinion. Does it kill the knife for me? Absolutely not. But it, that lack of attention to detail and thoughtfulness for the end user does kind of bum me out because this could have been a very, very, very high scoring knife on my leaderboard. But when I think about those things, like how does it get there? It gets there by taking risks. And this one took almost none. Again, I highly appreciate the single body screw. That's ballsy. I like that. It tells me that they were thinking about it at some point, but the rest of it feels a little rushed. And I would definitely love to get my hands on a version 2.0. John Demko did a hell of a job designing this knife, but he played it safe. And so while this could have been a nine or possibly even a 10, had they done a few extra things differently and better, it's going to get an eight out of 10. I've been rambling like a madman. Let's go ahead and add up the scores. Materials is an eight. Ergonomics is a seven. Fidget factor is an eight. The lock is a seven. And then fit and finish is an eight. You add up all of those and you get a 36. 36 out of 50 is a high recommend. It's not the highest of high recommend. And I'll tell you why. It's not because I don't like this knife. The more I handle it, the more I, I enjoy it. But at the $300 price point, it, it, it's a template for a $300 knife. There's nothing super special about this. Uh, this is a knife that I think is a great knife. And if you're truly wowed by the design language, then great, go out and get it. It's a high recommend. I think you'll be happy with it. If you don't care about, you know, jimping on the spine of the blade with a choked up grip, good for you. I think you'll be happy with it. But at 300 bucks, I'm not looking at this knife. I'm going to be looking for something that takes more risks comes down to personal preference in the end. If you agree with me, if you disagree with me, I want to hear your thoughts in the comment section down below. 
Guys, if you liked the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, boo-hoo, don't know why you're still here, but there's a button for you too. And if you want to see more just like it, make sure you hit subscribe. I'm Roll Shambo. I'll catch you on the flip side.